Good morning and welcome back. So today we'll be talking about the Twin City Zephyr, which was one of the premier trains of the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad. This train started as an outgrowth of the successful Pioneer Zephyr that was an articulated train set built by the Bud Company in 1934. These trains were one of the more memorable Zephyrs to run the Burlington system. And I say trains because they were both sets and a route. And there were multiple and there were two runs a day for a good chunk of that history. And in a sense, I do believe they were, at least should be considered the flagship of the railroad. So also just my own personal opinion. I'm not really sure if the Zephyr, if the, any of the Zephyrs or the CB and Q really had a flagship train like a lot of other um, railroads tended to have back then. So in this video, I will be going over the history of the Twin Cities Zephyr in a bit more detail and some of the other trains that ran between the Twin Cities and Chicago on the CB and Q. As mentioned a couple of videos ago, the CB&Q is one of the main Granger railroads to exist in American history. This is down to it being, it also was one of the most successful of the time. Part of this is down to the successful management of Charles Elliott Perkins and the financial backing of John Murray Forbes. Under their management, the CB&Q grew to being a regional behemoth. And it, frankly, in my opinion, the pinnacle of what it meant to be a Granger railroad in the United States, the Burlington built built itself slowly and then exploded after the end of the Civil War. Railroads in the U.S. exploded after the Civil War and arguably the period between 1869 when the first transcontinental railroad was completed to the peak of the Panic of 1893 was the era of explosive growth in the railroad industry. During this time, the CB&Q went from being a railroad that connected small towns in Chicago towards Omaha to connecting every city of importance in the Midwest and Plains. Along with working with farmers, ranchers, towns, and other businesses to grow themselves to their potential. Back in the mid 1800s, having a rail connection was one of the major things that could push an area and make it be on the map, quote unquote, so to speak, both literally and actually figuratively. With a rail connection, getting goods into town was easier and cheaper than hauling in things on horseback or by foot, which was usually horseback, because let's be real, no one's gonna haul like cans of stuff like hundreds of miles into a town. And the CB&Q was the biggest and most successful railroad in this part of the country, with a uh, possible exception of the Union Pacific. The biggest contributor to the success of the CB&Q was it being absorbed into the Hill Empire. As mentioned, frankly, at this point in several videos, um, most notably the last video on the Zephyr, the Empire Builder episode, the North Coast Limited episode, and I believe even the City of Portland episode. <laughs> so we're going on at least four video, five videos here because of the Cascades video. The railroads in the upper Midwest and the Northwest consolidated into a quasi-cartel under the leaderships of James J. Hill, who was the railroad tycoon that built the Great Northern Railroad into what it be was, basically. As time went on, he absorbed the Northern Pacific, um, and together they built the Spokane, Portland, and Seattle along the north bank of the Columbia River, and eventually brought the CB&Q into the fold, making this conglomeration into a full quote-unquote transcontinental system. Charles Perkins sold the CB&Q to Hill because he felt the Great Northern was a better fit for the long-term prospects of the CB&Q than being absorbed into the Harriman Empire, which was primarily the Union Pacific. And I believe at this point they also had controlling interests in the SP, which I know they did for fact. I Missouri Pacific, and there's another railroad somewhere in the Midwest that he also had a controlling interest in besides the CB&Q, or not the CB&Q, besides the Missouri Pacific. This connection gave them the stability over the course of its history in a similar manner to the Chicago and Northwestern um, had with the Union Pacific throughout basically all of its existence. So to make a very long and very complex history of what railroad acquired what railroad in what year and where the no-name and paper railroad went to or was chartered to go to and then rigmarole, just gonna, as I know I've at least time of filming this got an influx of newer people watching this, I don't find this history interesting so I'm just not gonna bother recording too much of it because a lot of these railways were existed on paper not in actuality but at least in general in this part of the world at this period of history so the burlington made it to the twin cities in 1886 and the burlington ran east from chicago to the mississippi river near dubuque hopefully i'm pronouncing that correctly and from here the railroad turned to follow the mississippi river up to the twin cities this is in contrast to the chicago northwestern and the milwaukee road who built along lake michigan to milwaukee and then turned northwest from there Although this meant that the CB&Q did avoid bigger cities like Milwaukee, but after 1901 this didn't really matter because their connection with the Great Northern and Northern Pacific kind of made up for the difference. Not to mention that sometimes doing something different isn't always the thing that kills you in the world of competition. 
and capitalism. And going to the Mississippi River and serving people there is also a good thing, which would mean less competition, even though it is a much smaller market. But again, less competition in a smaller market, not necessarily a bad thing. As for what kind of services the CB&Q was running before those efforts were launched in the 1930s, I'm not sure exactly what they were doing besides the train I'm going to talk about in a second. But from what I'm willing to guess is that they would have, like other railroads would have been doing in that in the period between 1870 and 1935 was at some point they ran trains with wooden cars and eventually that gave way to the heavyweight cars until they were inevitably replaced by the Zephyr sets themselves in the 1930s. That being said, in 1930, the CB&Q did launch what it termed its anniversary fleet, quote unquote, which was meant to commemorate 80 years of being in business. In 1930, they relaunched three other trains with brand new train sets ordered from Pullman before the market crashed in 1929. These trains were the Axar Ben running from Chicago to Lincoln, the Aristocrat, which ran from Chicago to Denver, and the Black Hawk, which ran from Chicago to the Twin Cities. These new trains ran with, as I mentioned, Pullman built trains and ran with the following setup. They'd have a baggage car, a smoker's lounge slash coach car, some number of chair cars, a club car, a diner, at least four Pullman sleepers, and a solarium lounge. These trains were meant to be some of the most luxurious trains in the region at the time, and the solarium lounge even had a small kitchen and seating area in it for people to get a quick snack while they were on the train. Uh, this was an overnight train because, well, one, it was heavyweight, so it took like 12 hours to actually go from Chicago to the Twin Cities. And um, so, like, food service wasn't always a big deal on some of these trains that ran these long overnight schedules. So they would have a diner mostly for breakfast and maybe, like, a little, like, coffee shop or snacks if you're hungry in the middle of the night or earlier into the trip. And as I'm guessing, and I wasn't able to find any CB&Q schedules, or at least um, not ones old enough to really confirm or deny this, but I'm willing to bet there were some daytime local trains and or heavyweight trains that, run, that ran the route as well. Since the usual service level or service patterns in the U.S. at the time were generally to have a limited stop daytime coach train, an overnight train, and a train that basically made all the, all the stops, and then a mail train that, again, also made all the stops, but the other coach train might make a few of them less but again digressing there's usually four trains on those routes a day in this part of the in frankly most of the mainline trains in the u.s again that's a thing that amtrak still hasn't learned <clears throat> even though the cb and q didn't go bankrupt or through some sort of um reorganization and i mean bankruptcy reorganization during the great depression like the other rangers did frankly a lot of railways during the 1930s did that didn't mean they didn't take a hit to their passenger trains and other parts of their business. At this point, the CB&Q is under Ralph Budd, who came in to run the railroad in 1932, and his focus was on efficiency and respects to all of the company's operations, including the passenger trains. And this is where we get to more of the specifics of this. This is where he talked to Edward Budd of the Bun Company to build a quote-unquote train of tomorrow that would be more efficient to run than heavyweight steam haul trains that were currently running along the U.S. as a railroad network at the time. This push led to the development and launch of the Pioneer's effort that, again, I mentioned a couple episodes ago, and the train was numbered 9900. As mentioned in the video about the Burlington and its fleet of Zephyrs, the Pioneer's effort was a fixed train set made up of articulated stainless steel cars powered by diesel engines, and the list little three-car train turned out to be an incredibly popular piece of equipment after its dawn-to-dusk run between Chicago and Denver. With the immediate success of the Pioneer Zephyr, the Burlington ordered more of these train sets, the first pair being numbered 9901 and 9902, which were assigned to the newly launched Twin City Zephyr. These new train sets were copies of the original Pioneer Zephyr, so they were three tr car train sets that seated about 100 people. These train... These trains were quickly overrun with customers. The three-car train sets were delivered in 1935 and were replaced with their new seven-car train sets in November of 1936. The new train sets were also expected to run twice daily, so they would run from end to end and back within a day. The new train sets had 1,800 horsepower for its prime mover, which was actually two 900 horsepower engines, which is from what I understand a lot of things that actually train manufacturers and still do this to this day, is if it's like they have like 6,000 horsepower engines, they might have two 3,000 horsepower prime movers rather than having one giant one. And I'm not an engineer or a mechanic, so I don't really know why they would do that. I'm guessing it's easier to fix or move if they need be, but they, uh, that's just my um, completely unqualified guess. And on top of those 900 horsepower engines, a smaller diesel generator was used to power the lights and other creature comforts on this train. The 1800 horsepower engine was, in a way, a prototype for EMD's E-series of locomotives. Also, I, I kind of have to note that the engine on this on these Zephyr sets were detachable from the rest of the train. 
but the seven coaches were still articulated together. This new train set had two full coaches, a bunch of coach dinettes, which I think was like two or three of them, a parlor car with a private room, and a parlor lounge. Each train had a combined capacity of 176 coach passengers and at least 40 first class seats. These trains were called the Train of the Gods and the Train of the Goddesses, and each car in the train set was named after a Greek or Roman god or goddess, depending on which set you were on. These trains were also fast by American standards, um, both then and now, sadly. The schedule for the Twin City Zephyr was originally set to six and a half hours, which was quickly cut by 15 minutes. At the time, as time went on, the CB and Q eventually relaxed the schedules, and the runtime was lengthened back to its original six and a half hour schedule. By the time of the BN merger, uh, the Zephyr was running on a seven hour schedule between Chicago and the Twin Cities. And also at this time, the Twin Cities um, Zephyr was hauling a combined Empire Builder North Coast Limited uh, between Chicago and St. Paul where they would split, run their separate routes to Spokane, and then shuffle their cars around into their respective Portland and Seattle section and then keep running as a combined train to their terminating points. The schedule was slower than the test runs of the train, though. The test run for the 430-mile route was an hour shorter than the public schedule was, so it was about five and a half hours. This led to the Zephyr running at an average speed of 80 miles an hour, which is sadly faster than the Acela runs on average. Like, I know there's like this, like sections of the, where the Acela could do over 100 miles an hour, but yeah, in average runtime terms, like the trains now are not appreciably faster in average end-to-end -end run speeds than they were back then. And in some cases, they're actually a lot slower. America. So as, as mentioning, the, this, this high-tier regional train from the 30s is actually, again, faster than Amtrak's premier train. And the Ze Zephyr ran with the morning and afternoon section, much like the Coast Daylight did on the SP, which I will give Amtrak credit. At least they ran before the COVID. The, the cell, I think, ran about almost hourly in the Northeast, and like the two trains a day these trains are running. But still, damn, we are not. We don't believe in speed when it comes to train in the, trains in this country. All the, also... <laughs> the Zephyrs were sort of known for putting on a good dining service. Yes, the Burlington was like the SP in the sense that it wasn't known for having like the best food ever to exist on the rails, but it still put on a good service in all of its dinettes. And like I discussed in the video on pre Amtrak dining, the food service during the Depression era was more was far more expansive than the food service after the Second World War. During the Second World War, railroads had to cut their food services a lot because of rationing and to some extent food service didn't entirely recover the pre-war level of service once the war was over. Part of this was just the railroads being cheap, having fewer options makes it easier and cheaper for railroads and frankly any food service um, company to provide food service. And even in the late 1940s before railroads hit the skids on passenger services they were interested in cutting costs as much as they could get away with. For example, a pre-war menu has nine entrees and a plethora of side options and the post-war menu has three entrees and a more limited selection of side choices and by that I'd hopefully I'm throwing in a picture of or pictures of um, menus from the um, Zephyr of this time period uh, the side options are like salads and sandwiches and lighter options like that following World War II things changed again for the Twin City Zephyr in 1947 the train was re-equipped this re-equipping kind of was a prelude to the launch of the California Zephyr about two years later this was the first time the Burlington route used its Vista domes on any of its passenger trains. The new train car was different in that it had individual cars, or well, the whole train was different, sorry, mis misenglished. But anyways, the trains had individual cars so they could be rearranged as needed. The basic consist was seven cars, and there was a baggage buffet lounge car, a dining car, four dome coaches, a parlor dome observation car on the end, and depending on demand and the equipment availability, domeless bud coaches could also be substituted into the fleet or added during the peak months. The same thing could be said for the <clears throat> parlor car service. Standard ones would, the standard cars would sometimes be substituted or added to the train as demand and or availability required. And if you want to learn more about what the difference is between a lot of these uh, service offerings, I would recommend the first video I ever made. Hopefully I remember to link it somewhere. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, I'll forget. Anyways, the coach domes carried 54 people on their main floor with 24 open seats upstairs in the dome section. The domes were a good addition to the fleet 
because the Zephyr ran along the Mississippi River and the domes gave passengers better views of the river and other scenery and animals along the way. And for whatever reason, the CB&Q never ran dome diners like the Union Pacific did or dome sleepers like the Milwaukee Road did. The sleeper one could also just be because they didn't really run that many longer distance overnight trains. But I don't believe the Northern Pacific or the Great Northern did either. As time wore on, cuts eventually came to the CB&Q just like it, it did for other railroads around the U.S. Eventually, the four daytime trains that ran between Chicago and St. Paul were reduced. First, the major reduction was the combination of the Empire Builder and North Coast Limited into one train that ran that the Burlington handled between Chicago and the Twin Cities, which went from being competing trains to one train on the least CB and Q side. The final schedule during this time period and the, for the only year the Burlington Northern ran passenger trains was that one of the Twin Cities Zephyr round trips was replaced with the combined North Coast Limited Empire Builder. And uh, surprisingly in all of this, the Blackhawk actually held on very long into uh, well, the end of private op passenger operations in this country. It wasn't canceled until April 12, 1970, which was about two weeks into Burlington Northern's existence and about a year before Amtrak itself came into existence. Prior to that, in the 1960s, the Black Hawk was handling through cars from the Western Star and Main Streeter and eventually formed the eastern legs of those two trains until it was eventually canceled as well. And the primary competition for the Black Hawk was the Chicago Northwestern's Northwest Limited and the Milwaukee Road's Pioneer Limited. With the coming of Amtrak meant the end of the days of the Zephyrs. Amtrak didn't retain the Zephyrs as part of its schedule, but it did keep the Empire Builder, um, as mentioned in its video, and eventually revived the North Coast Limited. The difference was is that Amtrak rerouted these trains over the Milwaukee Road between Chicago and St. Paul, and to this day, the planned additional trains between Chicago and Minneapolis will likely run the old Milwaukee Road route or the old C Chicago Northwestern route. And um, Amtrak actually is currently possibly maybe considering forming something of a committee to investigate fully doing this someday by 2035. <laughs> so hopefully there'll be more services between the Twin Cities and Chicago. Um, out of all the routes um, in the Amtrak's 2035 pathetic plan, those I do think are the most likely to work out because I know the Minnesota side of it is actually, I think, nearly completed and they'll probably be running in the next few years pending equipment availability. So there probably will be some sort of revived Twin Cities Chicago service a la the, one of the either the Zephyrs or the trains I will be talking about in the next couple of videos, which will be, or um, actually rather the Chicago Northwestern one was the last video, sorry. But um, either way, um, they'll be revived soon. And uh, before we totally close this out, there are two final facts I'd like to note about the Twin Cities Zephyr that um, we'll eventually end this on. The second pair of Zephyr was launched after spending time on public display to 44 sets of twins for some reason um, as they left their stations on the first run. The second fact is that the CB&Q's pasture service to the Twin City actually carried more people in 1964 than it did in 1939, so not every part of the United States had declining passenger services a la the 1960s, but the profitability went down the toilet, so... Part of that I also do think is because I know the CB&Q is adding slumber coaches to some of its consists, which did perform better, but as mentioned in the video about it, they didn't save passenger services, because honestly, there was probably nothing saving privately run passenger services at that time, but that is that topic of that video, so I won't be getting into a long ramble about that here. So I hope you did like this, and will subscribe, or watch more, or see you in the next one, or comment, or whatever tickles your fancy. Either way, I will see you in the next one, which will be... I'm not entirely sure what the next one's going to be at this time. <laughs> it might be the city of Denver. It might be something else. Uh, we'll figure that out when um, I get to it. I'll see you then. Bye.